Hello and welcome to a vaccinated episode of In the Faculty Lounge. I'm Paul Houtman, Dean of the Graduate School of Medicine, and I'm joined today by Imran Qureshi, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Radiology at the Graduate School. Imran, or Q, as some people refer to you <laughs> as, welcome. Thank you. Oh, glad to be here. So uh, Dr. Qureshi is um, a graduate of the University of Tennessee here in Knoxville, where he majored in computer engineering. He then got his medical degree at East Tennessee State University, did an internship at Case Western Reserve, a residency at the University of Louisville in diagnostic radiology, and a fellowship in abdominal imaging at the University of Maryland. And it's in that context that we brought him in the faculty lounge today to discuss what's new in radiology, especially with regard to artificial intelligence. But maybe before we get there, let's start more at the beginning. What got you interested in medicine? Because the early career signals was were that you were heading into computer engineering. Definitely. Um, my father the electrical engineer. So I think I had that kind of in my blood. I used to like to tinker when I was a kid, take apart the VHS player or the CD player and see how it worked and put it back together hopefully put it back together. Um, and uh, that's kind of, you know, I, I love programming. There was a Fortran programming class at Pell Sippy uh, over the summer. When I was in middle school, I, I went there and I didn't realize everyone else there was in their upper 30s. I was the only, <laughs> like, only 12 year old there. That's right? hilarious. <laughs> but we, we programmed, it was fun, right? It was the days of the internet without images and just text, it was fun. Um, but I don't think it was, not until I took AP Biology in high school, at Farragut High School, Miss Howe. Uh, she was very passionate about, about biology. And it, it, it struck me with awe, honestly, because with technology, you're working in kind of a man-made sandbox or someone else's sandbox, right? Uh, but with biology, it's like just natural phenomenon. It's like God's creation. And you look at it and it's, so, it's beautiful, right? And I was like, I need to study this. This is, this is you know, I can use the same um, uh, mindset that you use for engineering, but I apply that to medicine, right? Albeit in college, I think I was uh, a little of two minds, which way to go. Um, but I, and so I, I chose computer engineering, and I thought I might do like a medical physics uh, master's. But towards the end of college, I did a month of medical billing for a nephrologist at Maynardville, uh, in Tennessee, and I shadowed him at the same time. And I was like, I just, I gotta do this, right? And so, my last summer after graduating from UT, I it was a whirlwind summer where I took my prereqs, what I, I took organic one, organic two, <laughs> I took the MCAT, right? And, the, and the, all in that summer, and I applied for medical school right after that, and, and then lo and behold, went to ETSU. So I, I wonder how many of your classmates uh, during your undergraduate years ended up pivoting from uh, computer engineering to medicine. I can't imagine many of them. I, there wasn't many at all. There wasn't many at all. Yeah. I mean, but I think nowadays there's, there's more emphasis on, you know, back then we had, you know, um, uh, a major called pre-medicine or pre-med. And now I don't think they offer that major in most colleges. You know, you have to do like microbiology or biology and... I think medical schools are looking for uh, folks who have majored in different things like engineering and business and, and things like that now. And to some degree, it was prescient for you to do this, I think, because um, especially by going into radiology, because there's a nexus there that seems to be expanding, if you will, that uh, so much of radiology is tied to computing. And yeah. uh, we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit more detail um, soon. Um, was your attraction to radiology based on your computing background? Well, when I got, in, got into medical school, I kind of had in my mind that, okay, all that technology stuff, I got I to gotta leave, it, leave it alone, right? I got to concentrate on medicine, and this is what I'm doing. Um, but, uh, and, you know, most med schools don't teach radiology that well. You know, you see a chest radiograph, uh, maybe a CT scan during your anatomy rotation, um, but you don't get that much, right? Um, it was, and I really, so I really was gung-ho to do surgery, urology specifically. If you look at my research in med school, it's all about like sperm motility and all these very 
um, surgery oriented uh, projects. But it was during my surgery rotation where um, we were rounding and my chief resident was, he said that, oh, this patient had an adre adrenal abscess. We're going to send him to, to radiology. And I was like, well, we send him to radiology. What, what are they going to do? Right. So I asked if I could follow the patient. Um, and so we went to the basement of JCMC, John Kennedy Medical Center, and I entered the IR suite. And it was just these monitors buzzing everywhere, right? little cross hatches and things everywhere with two CT scanners on the side. And I was like, this is like the, the cockpit of like Starfleet Enterprise. Like, where am I? This is amazing. Where was this hiding, right? And I was like, I, this is so cool. And then um, the patient had already been scanned with a CT scanner. And there was crosshairs on the adrenal abscess, and there's a laser light pointing on the on the patient's skin, um, where how to access the patient. And I put my lead on, and I was told to stand next to the patient. Uh, then um, about five minutes later, Dr. Jernigan, uh, one of the IR docs over there, walks in, um, preps the drapes. He had the needle like a catheter about this long with like a very sharp tip. He just pokes it in. He undoes it. Open the syringe and it was white uh, perlite material. He's like, what do you think this is? And I said, it looks like an abscess. And he's like, he drops it, he goes, my job's done. And he just leaves, <laughs> right? And I was like, the day before, I was in a multi-hour Whipple procedure <laughs> as a med student. And today, someone just accessed a retroperitoneum in less than five minutes. What is going on? I was like, whatever this is, I gotta do this. And so it was, yes, it was because of the technology. I was like, this is kind of coming together. And so, um, yeah, then I went down the road of radiology. And it sort of does come together, if you will, um, even more so today. So I thought we could spend a few minutes talking about artificial intelligence sort of globally in radiology yeah. and also project ahead what the impact is going to be long term and then what the potential uh, detours will be along, along that way. You and I have had a number of conversations about that and are looking potentially at some uh, possible research avenues in that area. But let's Let's take a step back. AI and radiology, what does it mean from 30,000 feet? Sure. So first, we should define what AI means because artificial intelligence is a very loaded word. And honestly, all programming, could you could call it artificial intelligence. But the big data revolution that happened in 2010 around there um, was when the idea of processing large amount of data came to fruition because we got much better processing power in computers. You GPUs and different, different uh, parallel processing, uh, things where we could um, actually process data. And so machine learning is actually what we're talking about uh, when we talk about modern AI. Uh, and the difference is that software before, someone would hard code, this is, let's say for radio, this is what the absence looks like, right? It has these features, right? And then whenever you would have an uh, image, it would say, okay, this is what I was programmed to do, and this is how it looks like. This is abscess, this is not abscess, right? And that's kind of, we have breast CAD and things like that that follow that pattern. Uh, AI, what you do is you build a program that says, I want to teach you how to look at an image. These are pixels, these are densities, these are these uh, images, uh, uh, values. And then you just feed it a bunch of images, and you say that these are abscesses, right? Um, again, you're not defining the abscess. And the computer will take all that information and make correlations between all those images. And so it's learning what an abscess looks like. And each time it goes to a new image, it takes that image and it correlates to what it already has. And so it, it, it's learning, right? So they, you know, it's, it's like, oh, the computer's alive in a way, right? So it, it's learning. It's, it's, not, it's a dynamic program. Um, and so that's, that's, that's what AI is, right? Um, so when AI first came out, or it was in the academic uh, sphere of uh, computer scientists, uh, there was a lot of a lot of a lot of uh, talk about oh, this is going to replace radiologists, this is going to replace physicians, right? Um, but now uh, that kind of happens with whenever whenever there's like new technology and people are very excited about technology. Um, now the reality is kind of we can and we can talk about this. The reality is coming to fruition. What can AI actually do in mm -hmm. medicine? Um, and it's more uh, of an augmentation of of what we can do, uh, and it will change practice patterns for sure. Um, and there's a lot of use cases in AI. Um, one thing that I'm particularly interested in is something called 
uh, uh, radiomics, which it's a subset of precision medicine. Uh, and I'll give you just a quick example. So me and uh, Charles Anthony, uh, our Hemonc uh, professor here, uh, are starting to work on this, this project where you get colorectal cancer and uh, you can apply um, AI to it and it looks at different imaging features of that cancer. Um, and then when you treat it, it looks at the same cancer. And right now what we do as radiologists, we're measuring size and like nodularity. But that AI can look at different things, mainly the texture, right? So um, you can tell, oh, um, the cancer had a lot of edema on the outside, but now that edema is moving toward the inside of the cancer. A thing that's very hard to perceive for a human. And that those features, or that feature set of imaging biomarker correlates to certain histologies or, or, or pathology. And so you know that, oh, this treatment's working or the treatment's not working. And then um, you can have early endpoints like, oh, we'll change treatment because we can tell in a month that this is not working. So do you foresee a time when uh, conventional radiographic imaging, chest x-ray, mammography, and so forth will be mostly computer read and perhaps in some way overread by uh, a trained radiologist? I mean, it certainly would seem that it would be faster whether, uh, you know, it's better, I guess, remains to be seen. And also, you know, there's there's no clinical correlation that AI can necessarily use. I, I mean, yeah. maybe there is. Maybe it can be tied to EMR. Yeah. Take that into account and uh, uh, delineate perhaps with greater accuracy whether a particular finding is benign or malignant. But sure. how do you what 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 does the future hold for for that as a paradigm for radiology? Sure, sure. So, so for the sh short answer is that not completely. So what AI is what we are learning now. What AI is good to good for is answer a very particular question: Is there a pneumothorax? Is there a fracture? Right, um, it, it's it's good at those kind of questions. Reading an entire chest radiograph uh, with clinical context, uh, with knowing history, we haven't been able to do that. Um, and so, and there's a reason that we probably won't be able to do that. Right? Um, sure, there's FDA approved um, AI that can find hemorrhage in the brain. At least it will, it will tell the radiologist, I believe there's hemorrhage here. Right? It might be calcifications or some other other pattern, but it's 97% accurate, right? But it's not gonna measure everything else in the brain. You need stack of AI, right? Um, the, the, the issue is that if the AI can only be as good as the data it has, there's a big data problem in, in medicine. Um, first, we have data silos, right? Data's trapped in different places in the hospital, um, privacy concerns, and you know, even if you open up silos, what happens is, um, our data is not really clean in medicine. If you read one physician, physician's note to another physician, physician's note, styles are different, uh, data is different. Sure. Um, you know, the physical exam might be copied from the day before, which probably shouldn't do, but the computer is going to take everything as truth, right? And but as humans, we can um, we we can judge, right? So there was a recent test. I think it was in um, uh, UCLA, I believe, um, where they made this amazing AI that could actually read a chest radiograph, right? Uh, on like a thousand or so chest radiographs. And it worked pretty well in that hospital. Um, they took the same AI and went down the street to another hospital and it totally failed, right? But a radiologist can go from one hospital to another hospital and there's no difference, right? Sure. It's just that the protocol was slightly different, right? Uh, and they showed that if you like reduce the quality of the image by like 10%, it goes away. So you have this data problem, you have this, um, uh, the other issue is that medicine keeps on evolving. So if we get a, a you know, new type of test, rate, test radiograph uh, or you know, imaging protocol, you have to start all over. Or again. You start all over right, again. Understood. Right? Yeah. So, so one problem. We'll finish with this. Uh, you know, that you and I have discussed and that we're uh, thinking about is how would you know that a particular AI algorithm. Uh, is not working the way it should work, uh, sure. whether it's been through malintent corrupted mm -hmm. uh, or it's it, there, there's something that's just not working the way it was intended. Yeah. And do you need a system on top of that system to monitor the AI algorithms? Just imagine for a moment what would happen if 
you didn't detect a, uh, a problem with the algorithm and all of a sudden 100 or 1,000 mammograms are read wrong. So mm -hmm. what, what I mean, this is a burgeoning field. Yeah. We're interested in getting into that field here at yeah. the Graduate School of Medicine. Um, tell us a little bit about that. So yeah, there's a lot of discussion uh, in, in the uh, medical AI field about what we call black box AI, where um, an algorithm gets so good that you input stuff and you just trust what comes out, right? Um, there's a lot of pushback against that because uh, what some software companies are trying to do is for every decision to tell us why the AI is going down that pathway, right? Like, oh, I saw edema here, I saw this here, I saw these things there. But um, honestly, it's, it's one of those areas where they're still dealing with it right now. They're trying to figure out how best to monitor AI. Should we even, should we just accept black box AI if it's working very well, right? I think it's just about monitoring the outcomes um, uh, constantly and making sure that there's no um, uh, aberrations in, in the outcomes. But we've seen AI in, in different fields, um, uh, not in medicine, get hacked, right? Uh, and cause power outages for like a quarter of the state. So it, it happens, right? Uh, it can happen. And, uh, and, and medicine is a, it's a you, you can't take those same types of risks. So it, it is an issue, definitely. Yeah, and I know it's an issue with the FDA that they've expressed concern about this. So that's a, like I said, it's a burgeoning field. And with your background in computer engineering, maybe yeah. you can be a leader in that field well, along with us. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. For joining us, uh, Imran. Q, Dr. Qureshi, <laughs> uh, for this wonderful and interesting discussion. And we'll be meeting other faculty members soon in the faculty lounge. Until then, thank you for joining us in this vaccinated library, and we'll see you soon.